In today's video, we'll look at why vitamin B12 is so important, why many people struggle to get enough, and why taking high doses of oral B12 can actually make your deficiency symptoms worse. B12 has been a very tricky vitamin for Elliot, and we're both really grateful to Dr. Greg Russell-Jones, who's taught us so much about its importance in our bodies and how we can activate it. Enjoy the video. Vitamin B12 deficiency is a really nasty condition and many of the symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency overlap with the symptoms of ME-CFS. In this video, we're going to look at why standard blood test ranges of B12 can be deceptive and how even being moderately below the optimal levels can inflict considerable damage to the brain and to your nervous system. Therefore, if you suspect that you might have B12 deficiency, please consult your doctor urgently because early treatment can prevent long-term permanent issues. So this is really important. We all need 13 different vitamins to stay alive and to stay healthy. We only really need tiny amounts of these molecules, but they're absolutely essential for our bodies. We need them to build muscle, to repair our tissue and our organs, and to provide us with the energy from the food we eat, as well as to protect us from infections and to clean the toxins out of our body. So our bodies depend on us eating the right foods to get these vitamins, because we cannot make them ourselves. If we don't eat enough of a particular vitamin and our supplies dwindle, we can develop very serious diseases that can kill us eventually. And it is a really widespread problem because according to an analysis of data over a 12 year period up until 2018, vitamin B12 deficiency was affecting over 12% of all adults. Let's go through what the signs of vitamin B12 deficiency are. So early signs of B12 deficiency can be fatigue, brain fog, forgetfulness, and difficulty concentrating. This is because vitamin B12 is essential for a process in your body called methylation. And a really large proportion of what that process does is to make a molecule called creatine, which is crucial for your energy. In other videos, we've talked about how Elliot had incredibly low levels of creatine, but by supplementing that, it really helped his brain energy. If you haven't got B12 working, you're not gonna have good levels of creatine. Next, does B12 levels drop gradually? Your body's ability to produce healthy red blood cells and to maintain your nervous system is going to become compromised. And that's going to give you sensations of pins and needles. It's also going to give you digestive issues such as indigestion, bloating and nausea. Then the next stage, as you develop a significant B12 deficiency, you'll experience very severe fatigue, dizziness, shortness of breath, because your red blood cells don't mature and so they're abnormally large and they're not efficient at transporting the oxygen that you need around your body. At that stage it's called megaloblastic anemia and you can also experience mood changes including depression, irreversible nerve damage, numbness and tingling in your hands and feet, balance problems and difficulty walking. It can also lead to memory loss, confusion, and incontinence, as well as many other life-threatening complications. There's a really good film on YouTube about a nurse called Sally, who has worked really hard to raise awareness of the importance of vitamin B12. If you search on YouTube, Sally B12, you'll find it. It's worth a watch. <laughs> vitamin B12 is the only vitamin that contains the element cobalt. And it's the only element that you can't get from plants or from sunlight. It is made in the guts of animals. And therefore, the only way to get B12 from your diet is to eat animal products such as meat or seafood or to supplement it. So this means that vegetarians and vegans are at a real high risk of becoming deficient. And it's really important if you're not eating meat that you are proactive about supplementing and testing your B12 levels. So there are four different versions of B12, but only two of them are active forms that our cells can use. You're coming in. Okay, so now we have a cat helping us. 
There are two active forms of vitamin B12 and they're called methylcobalamin and adenylcobalamin. And then there's two versions that aren't active and they're called hydroxycobalamin and cyanocobalamin. And our bodies can't use those two forms unless our body can convert it into the active forms. So every day our cells need a lot of B12 to perform the complex chemical reactions that are happening all the time to keep us alive. Oh, and she's off again. And what happens is our body is just amazingly good at recycling. And to recycle our B12, we need to have plenty of active B2. And we've talked about it in other videos. To have active B2, we need to have enough iodine, selenium and molybdenum in our diet. So later in this video, I'm going to explain why having high levels of vitamin B12 in your blood tests may actually be a problem. Because if you have high levels of the forms of B12 that your cells can't use and you're not able to convert it into the active forms, then it's going to cause you a problem. We're also going to look at Elliot's B12 levels and you can guess if you think he was actually deficient in B12 or if he was just not able to use it. So first, how do we get vitamin B12? The foods with the highest amounts of B12 in are animal livers, beef, clams and oysters. So while Elliot was really sensitive to taking B12 supplements, we did manage to build him up to tolerate 30 grams or an ounce of chicken liver every day, which has got a lot of B12 in it. So originally I did give him lamb liver or beef liver, but after a while he started going a bit rusty coloured. <laughs> He kind of got rusty colour patches on his skin, which he was kind of going a bit vitamin A toxic, really, because the lamb and the beef liver have an awful lot of vitamin A. So the reason I swapped him to chicken liver was they have a lower amount of vitamin A. So then the rusty patches that he was developing went away. Chicken liver is so packed full of vitamins and minerals, such as B2, B3, B5, folate, iron, copper and selenium. So I would absolutely recommend having chicken liver every day if you're not well, or if you have any chronic illness, because it made such an instant difference to his bowels and gut movements. I don't know if he'll want me to go too much into detail here, but... If your bowel movement isn't a nice deep brown colour, then it means that your liver is struggling. And if you eat a little bit of animal liver, it's really going to help you out. So I consider chicken liver to be a superfood. I know some of you might find it difficult to swallow, but Elliot does still really enjoy it with mashed potatoes and gravy, mushrooms and onions. It's actually pretty wonderful. The thing is, there are many people that eat plenty of B12 in their diets, but they actually still become deficient because their bodies can't absorb it and they can't use it. So to absorb vitamin B12, our bodies use a really complicated pathway that uses many different steps. And actually taking a high dose supplement may actually be causing you problems and making your B12 deficiency worse. So let me just explain that process. When you eat B12, whether you get it from eating some meat or from taking a supplement, there's a protein called haptocorin. Oh, I do love these names. And it's secreted in your mouth into your saliva and it binds to the B12. And its job is to protect the B12 from the stomach acid destroying the B12. So the amount of haptocorin in your saliva is actually quite low. It could probably protect about 100 micrograms of B12 if you were swallowing a high dose oral B12 tablet. But that tablet might have over 10 times the amount of B12 in it. You might be swallowing a thousand micrograms or even a 2000 microgram tablet. But that would mean probably 90% of the B12 from that supplement is not going to be protected from your stomach acid. So that B12 from your supplement will become degraded and basically useless. So the second step is that your stomach also needs to produce a protein called intrinsic factor. So what can go wrong here? Well, problems occur because some people are not able to make intrinsic factor, particularly as people get older. Well, actually, not even that old. Once we get over 50, we have fewer cells that produce the intrinsic factor in our stomach. Without intrinsic factor, the B12 cannot get pulled from our guts through the receptors in our small intestine to enter into our bloodstream. So the people with this condition are known as having pernicious anemia. And it really is a very serious condition. 
it's probably the most well-known condition that doctors are on the lookout for really regarding B12. So the third step requires you to have enough stomach acid. So what can go wrong here? Well, older people also can suffer with inflammation and deterioration of their stomach lining, and that can reduce their stomach acid. It can also be made worse because many people are on antacids or protein pump inhibitors or other medications or have had gastric surgeries which reduce their stomach acids. So the fourth step to absorb B12 is that the contents of your stomach then move into your small intestine and that's where the intrinsic factor latches onto the B12 and then you have certain cells that line our small intestines that have receptors and they grab hold of the B12 with the intrinsic factor and pull it into our bloodstream. So what can go wrong with this step? Well, people that suffer with gut issues such as Crohn's disease or celiac disease have great difficulty pulling the B12 into their body, even if it has been digested and attached to the intrinsic factor. So anyone that's had long time diarrhea will also probably have low B12 because it hasn't had a chance to be absorbed. And also in a healthy gut, there's just not that many receptors that can pull the B12 into the bloodstream. The National Institute of Health acknowledges that only about 10 micrograms of a 500 microgram oral supplement is absorbed via the receptors on the wall of our guts. So assuming that you do have enough intrinsic factor and stomach acid, remember that B12 supplement that we just said that only 10% of it was protected from our stomach acid. The intrinsic factor doesn't know whether the B12 it's attaching itself to is intact or whether that B12 has been degraded by your stomach acid. That means that 90% of the material that's grabbed by the intrinsic factor will be degraded and useless. So even if the intrinsic factor grabs it and pulls it into our bloodstream, our cells won't be able to use it because it was destroyed by our stomach acid. So once the B12 has got into our bloodstream, there's another protein called transcopalamin. I love these words. And that transports your B12 into the cells that need it, or it will take any excess that you have into your liver to be stored. So what could be the problem here? Well, transcobalamin will transport both the intact and degraded B12 into the cells. It doesn't know the difference. And once inside the cell, there are two enzymes that use the B12, and these are very specific for just the two types of B12 that we mentioned earlier that are active. So that's the adenosyl and methylcobalamins. They're the two active forms. And so any inactive B12 that is transported into our cells gets removed from our cells. That gets back into the bloodstream and then the haptocorin that circulate in the blood will pick it up. So can you see there's a problem here? As more and more high-dose oral B12 is supplemented, the situation can just gradually get worse and worse because our blood is gradually accumulating more and more dud vitamin B12 that our cells can't use. And that gets picked up by the protein haptocorin. And that haptocorin, do you remember its job, was to protect the B12 from the stomach acid. And so the haptocorin that we're secreting in our saliva is already full of vitamin B12 that's useless. So it can't protect any new vitamin B12 that we consume or only a very small amount. So that process is happening over and over again every time we have a high dose supplement of B12. So the result is that over time, the levels of B12 in our blood just get higher and higher and higher. But more and more of that B12 is inactive and this is known as paradoxically high levels of B12 and so that makes it harder for our cells to find B12 that is actually active so that just gives us so many more deficiency symptoms because our cells can't find the good stuff. So it's also worth mentioning that there are other things such as smoking, alcohol, nitrous oxide and even diabetic medication that can all inactivate vitamin B12. So is there a good form of vitamin B12 that bypasses all these difficulties with absorption? Well, I'm not affiliated with Greg's company and we don't have any sponsorship deal. 
but it's been his expertise that has been absolutely instrumental in helping Elliot regain his health. And so for that reason, I can't praise Greg's B12 oils highly enough. They're topical oils that are rubbed into warm, dry skin and they completely bypass the digestive system. So that means, as I mentioned earlier, the National Institute of Health says that only 10 micrograms of a 500 microgram oral tablet will be absorbed. Whereas if you have a dose of B12 using the B12 oils, you'll be absorbing 80% of that dose in a form that your cells can use. So having an active form of B12 by injection is also a useful option, but in the UK, getting prescribed by a doctor injections of B12 isn't an easy thing, and I'm not qualified to explain how you can do that yourself. So for us, we really wouldn't consider using any other form of B12 other than the B12 oils that you rub in your skin. They are really potent and they're already activated in the adenosyl methyl versions. But taking the right form of B12 isn't all we have to do. So as we mentioned earlier, our body has to constantly recycle our B12 into that active form because once our bodies use it, it becomes inactivated. So it has to go around in a cycle to constantly being activated. And to do this, we need to have active B2. And we've already discussed in a previous video, which I will link somewhere, but a very quick summary is that B2 is an absolutely amazing vitamin. It's like a key that unlocks many of the other B vitamins, including vitamin B12. But for our bodies to use the molecules of riboflavin, the riboflavin or vitamin B2 has to be activated by enzymes. And those enzymes require three different minerals. So these crucial minerals are iodine, selenium and molybdenum. I'm getting better at that one. So let's briefly check the science of what we've been talking about. There are two active forms of vitamin B2, and these are known as FMN and FAD. And to make these, our bodies need iodine, selenium, and molybdenum. So both of the active forms of B2, which are the FMN and FAD, are used by the methylation enzymes, which are MTHFR and MTRR, and they activate vitamin B12. And so without enough active B12, about 200 methylation enzymes will just slow right down. And that's going to result in the B12 deficiency problems of fatigue, brain fog, high histamine levels, and all the other nasty issues that we get when we have high levels of inactive B12 in our blood. So let's talk about B12 blood tests. And I know you all want to know what Elliot's levels of B12 were. So there are a few blood tests that good doctors will run, but I'm just going to look into the very basic serum B12 blood test because that's easy to do at home if you don't have the cooperation of a good doctor. When you're looking at the numbers and the ranges, it's important to check what measurement your test is using because there are several different ones that are used in different countries. So Elliot's tests were measured in nanograms, which is NG, and that is the same as a picogram, which is a PG. So Yale Medicine gives the following ranges on its website. A normal range of B12 would be above 300 picograms or nanograms. It considers that you'd be borderline B12 deficient if you were below 300 down to 200. And then Yale would consider you to be B12 deficient if you have below 200 PGs in your blood tests. So you want to know what Elliot's were? His B12 levels were actually 698 PGs. So the lab range that he was given was up to 625. So Elliot's B12 levels were actually showing as high out of range for B12. So based on what we've just been talking about, it seems that Elliot at this point had paradoxically high levels of B12, but it was inactive because his body wasn't using it. And so this would explain why he had awful reactions to even the tiniest amounts of active methyl B12, and he had really low levels of creatine. So we know that his methylation system really wasn't working. So the question is why? Why wasn't his body able to convert it to the active form of B12? Well, among other deficiencies, he was really very deficient in iodine, which meant that he wasn't able to activate his B2 to those two forms of B2 that can then recycle the vitamin B12. So actually, we've got a lot of things that we could talk about on the experiences we went through trying to get Elliot's methylation system working properly again. It really hasn't been an easy journey and we're still working on it, but 
For Elliot to get better, it has been absolutely necessary for him to go through this. In our next videos, we're going to delve a bit deeper into the processes that methylation is involved in and how getting those processes working caused Elliot some wonderful improvements, but also caused some really big challenges. Please do hit the notifications and subscribe and we'll let you know as soon as we get it out for you.